so I think I call every single redraft interesting. But this one could be especially that because there were a decent amount of high picks who ended up not being good between Josh Jackson, Frank Nielakina, Dennis Smith, Malik Monk, uh, Markel Fultz, although even then we can see a little bit of Fultz finding a place for himself in the league. I think a similar thing can be said for Lonzo. Two guys who initially you could say they were busts, although I never said Lonzo was a bust. It is well established that I am on the Lonzo train. Um... But you know those two types of guys. Like, where does some, where do they fall in a in a redraft? I think for some people they could end up being towards the bottom or potentially not in it at all. And I think for others they could have them a little higher. Uh, and I'll tell you now, there's probably one guy in particular that I'm gonna have really high on this list that I don't know if anybody else would. But we might as well dive in. I mean, hell, even the first pick is an interesting conversation. You're gonna go with Jason Tatum, Donovan Mitchell, De'Aaron Fox, or Bam. I think those would be the four. Personally, I'm going to go with Tatum. That could be me being a biased Celtics fan, but I think Tatum's ceiling is higher than Mitchell's or any of these guys. I mean, for one, Tatum could be the best perimeter defender in this whole thing. I mean, him and Lonzo and Fox and Mitchell for that regard. It's an interesting conversation. Tatum could be number one. And offensively, I mean, we saw the run the dude went on this year, and I think... That is the conversation we can have about Tatum now. Like, can he average 30 a game? Could Mitchell do the same thing? Yeah, sure. But if you force me to pick one, I'll just go Tatum, I guess. Uh, Mitchell number two. But if you went Mitchell over Tatum, I I wouldn't think you were crazy for that. So there you go. Uh, For number three and four, I'm deciding between De'Aaron Fox and Bam. And... You know, this year, Bam was better than Fox, but to be fair, Fox missed a decent amount of time because of injury. Like, when De'Aaron Fox was actually out there this season for the Kings, he was pretty great. I mean, what was what were his season averages and basically 45 games? 27-4. It's pretty good. His three-pointer dipped, which is not a great sign, but I still think Fox is a natural leader and... Even with the mess going on in Sacramento between whatever could happen in the front office and uh, the log jam up front and what position is Bagley and now they might have to trade Buddy Heald because there's those rumors circling around, they still have De'Aaron Fox. And as for Bam, I mean, you know, I had Bam second team all center this season, you know what I mean? That was a weird way of putting that, but you know what I mean. Because the dude's just great. I think he's the heart of Miami. His playmaking is awesome. He can switch across a bunch of positions. Um, I am going to go Fox, though, because I don't really know. I think it's just that guard versus center conversation, I guess. So the top four, Tatum, Mitchell, De'Aaron Fox, and Bam. So fifth, this is the one I was talking about where it would be like, wait a minute, you have that guy that high? Uh, Jonathan Isaac. I think the guy can be the best defensive player in the league and also give you like 17 and 11. I think somewhere I said that he can be the modern day Sean Marion. I really do believe that. I think you can play him at the four or center. And if it wasn't for injuries, then I feel like he would already be kind of heralded in that way in the sense of he would have made an all defense team. I mean, he would have pushed... If we're going by my all-defense teams for forward, he would have pushed Tatum out of there, and he could have even gotten first team over Giannis. Maybe, maybe not. That would that would have been tough, but uh, to me, Isaac is already that good. So for number six, it's kind of like a three-man contest for me. It's between Lowry, Markkanen, John Collins, and Lonzo. So right now, it is difficult to be high on Markkanen because of the season he just had. And how much of that do you want to blame on his lack of aggressiveness and confidence versus Jim Boylan just being stupid? As of right now, I'm going to go a little more towards the X's and O's were bad. I think Markkanen has still got a lot of potential and I think his ceiling is still pretty damn high. So I feel like I'm going to have him for number six. And then between Collins and Lonzo, you know, both of them, 
I think, have the cases to support them, but also to go against them. With Collins, I think there's still a question about how good he is defensively, even if he was better uh, this year for the Hawks. I think there's fears about his fit with Clint Capella, and if he's going to be able to stretch out the floor like that. He can make threes, but does he want to just chill in the corner for a couple more possessions a game, you know? Is he a good enough playmaker? Is he good at all the boring stuff, you know, like setting good screens besides the ones that he just catches alley-oops on, that type of thing? And basically, I'm asking just how much better does John Collins really make you? Because I am confident that Alonzo makes you better because, you know, it was the thing I've said all the time with Lonzo. It's the defense and so many plays that don't result in an actual statistic being recorded, but he makes the right play or the Lakers record with Lonzo versus without him since he was drafted and the on-off stuff is kind to him with the Pelicans as well. Like Lonzo's teams have just always been better when he's in the game and we saw his three-pointer take a, another jump or just a jump, I guess, this season. 38% on six and a half a game. It's pretty crazy. He still didn't shoot enough free throws. He was only taking one a game and he wasn't good at the line. So that's still a little concerning, but I'm still pretty high on Lonzo. I mean, really, these three guys, Markin and Collins and Lonzo, to me, they're just in the same group. And for the sake of it, I'll, I'll still have Markin at number six, Collins at seven, and Lonzo at eight. So now we're on, what, number nine? Yeah, uh, OG Ananobi. Multi-position defender. Got better offensively this season. I feel like OG could be a um, multi-time all-defense dude and he could even be an all-defense guy this season. I mean, when I was talking about my defensive forwards, I was mainly mentioning like Tatum, Jimmy Butler, Siakam. Maybe OG would be that guy for second team. Definitely not first team over Giannis or AD, but perhaps he could be a second team. And I think Ananobi at his highest offensive thing, probably like 15, 16 a game or so, He's already shown himself to be a good rebounder. Perhaps he could be like a six or seven rebound kind of guy. I don't know if he's ever going to be much of a playmaker. I don't totally care, assuming he's just competent at making the obvious pass. And I like him. Number 10, uh, Luke Kennard can make shots, do a little bit off the dribble. 16 points a game this year. Cool. Um, 11th, Dylan Brooks. Basically, everything I just said about Luke Kennard can be said about Brooks. 12th, uh, Zach Collins. The injury this year definitely hurts his stock. And there could be some fears still about his uh, size and strength at the center position, if that's what he's meant to do or if he's meant to be a power forward. But I think he can make shots from outside. I think he can roll as well as pop for three or mid-range and uh, I like his versatility potential on defense at least and I think if he didn't get hurt I think he would have proven himself to be a pretty decent impact guy for uh, for Portland 13th uh, Jared Allen just a solid big who could have potential to be one of the best bigs in the league, but he might just settle into being a pretty good one, which that's fine. I mean, even if his career is just supposed to be uh, one of those guys you play 20-something minutes, you give him about eight, nine million dollars a season, it's fine. I'll take that guy on my team, certainly. And uh, number 14... So there's a few options. There's Markel Fultz, there's uh, Kyle Kuzma, there's Josh Hart, uh, Malik Monk, if you're still believing in Dennis Smith or Frank Nielakina, okay. There's some deep cuts between Harry Giles or Justin Jackson or Derek White is another one. There's a Windu with the Magic who... Is, there, there is some excitement about him in the in the innards of Orlando Magic internet. 
Damian Dotson, Thomas Bryant, Monte Morris, my guy Monte, of course. But I think for 14, I'm going to go with uh, Markel Fultz. I think Fultz can still be good. It's the same thing I say every time. Like, he can still attack the basket. His free throws were pretty good this year, percentage-wise. He didn't shoot too many. Uh, I think defensively he can be good because he's 6'4 with a very big wingspan. He's athletic and all that. And Yeah, I think Fultz can still be all right. But it is a bit of a wild card pick, too. It's one of those things where uh, I think Fultz's ceiling and his floor are pretty far apart from one another because we don't know. I mean, I think a big question is his confidence. He seemed like he's weathered the whole jump shot thing pretty well. So uh, yeah, he could he could be good. So I got him at 14. Apologies to Kyle Kuzma and whoever else. So to recap this thing. The Lottery, 2017, uh, Jason Tatum, Donovan Mitchell, De'Aaron Fox, Bam, Jonathan Isaac, John Collins, Lowry Markinen, Lonzo, OG Ananobi, Luke Kennard, Dylan Brooks, Zach Collins, Jared Allen, and Markel Fultz. <laughs>